Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Friday, March 12th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. The proposal to create a modern arc, aka scientists want to store sperm and eggs in lava tubes on the moon as a backup plan in case we accidentally destroy the Earth. A new tool that could help us spot deep fakes and how beer making used to be women's work until men figured out how to monetize it and accused women brewers of being witches. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So, a group of scientists from the University of Arizona presenting at the IEEE Aerospace Conference over the weekend shared their proposal to build a modern-day arc on the moon. Except instead of a giant boat with two of each animal to save them from flooding, it would be cryogenically preserved sperm, eggs, seeds, and other DNA matter from all of Earth's species housed inside of lunar lava tubes. As a kind of global insurance policy in the case of a nuclear war, asteroid impacts, a worse global epidemic than we're experiencing now, the acceleration of climate change, or more. It's a lot, and it sounds ridiculous at the offset, but it's not actually that bizarre when you think about it. There's even a few precedents for it. Like the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, or its new neighbor, the Oreo Doomsday Vault. The Svalbard Seed Vault houses seeds for over a million of the world's crops in a long-term storage facility inside a mountain on a remote island between Norway and the North Pole, built to withstand any possible natural or man-made disasters. The Oreo one was just a marketing stunt. You can learn more about that on the October 26th episode of this show. Link in the show notes. So this modern-day arc on the moon thing is kind of like the Svalbard Seed Vault, but with the addition of animals and in space. But even that concept isn't completely brand new. Quoting Vice, Space-based sperm banks aren't a new concept. In 2019, scientists proposed that all woman astronaut crews on long-term missions where they needed to populate new planets could be sent on their way with sperm banks in tow. In that study, they sent up sperm from 10 Earthling donors, and the swimmers held up as well after their ride in space as they would have if they'd remained on the ground. End quote. All right, but what exactly is this new proposal? Quoting again, The University of Arizona team's plans for a celestial sperm and egg locker involves storing the cells inside of lunar pits. The moon is pockmarked with 200 of these pits, which are 80 to 100 meters deep, where lava used to flow on the moon. They can protect against dramatic temperature changes, asteroids, or radiation. NASA has previously said that these pits could serve as useful little shelters for visiting astronauts. In the lava pits, the sperms and eggs would be cryogenically frozen until needed, like if Earth's entire living population was decimated by one of the above disasters, for example. Elevator shafts could be installed in the pits for retrieval and testing. We can still save them until the tech advances to then reintroduce these species. In other words, save them for another day, the study's lead author Jack and Tanga said. Since the freezers will be too cold for humans, however, they'll also need robots to navigate within the tubes. But metal robots could freeze and jam up. For that, the team suggests developing robots that move around using quantum levitation that would allow them to maneuver through the delicate, cold arcs without touching the ground. End quote. So, basically, we're going to have robots on hoverboards retrieving our cryogenically frozen DNA in order to populate the moon with Earthling species. And despite all of that, it's still not completely far-fetched when you think about it. Not only have we already done or tried to do all kinds of weird things to the moon, but various doomsday scenarios on Earth continue to seem ever more likely. So any kind of backup plan, an insurance policy as the U of A scientists called it, kind of seems like a good idea. No word yet on which humans will get to donate samples, but if this proposal ever gets off the ground, it will take a while to complete. Quoting the Science Times, According to the researchers, carrying 50 samples from around 6.7 million organisms on Earth will require about 250 launches. End quote. 
And all I can think as I gear up for a new episode of Apple TV's For All Mankind dropping tonight is that the screenwriters of that alternate history show are probably kicking themselves that they didn't come up with this modern arc idea first. And it really seems much more like something out of science fiction than reality. Deep fakes are occasionally fun, like the Tom Holland and Robert Downey Jr. Back to the Future edit, or the TikTok account of an obviously fake but eerily realistic Joe Biden who does six skateboard tricks and has a giant Delaware back tattoo. But part of what makes those fun is, as real as they may look, they are obviously fake in their context and their intent to entertain. As we're all well aware by now, many deep fakes are more nefarious in their intent, created to both look real and deceive people into thinking any number of false and often divisive narratives. And unfortunately, for that type of usage, they just keep getting better and harder to spot. Well, Sway Lu, a digital forensics expert and professor of computer science at the University of Buffalo with over 20 years of experience in machine learning and computer vision projects, thinks he's figured out how to spot a deepfake. Lu, who previously assisted Facebook with their deepfake detection global challenge last year, says the tell is in the corneas. Quoting Lu, the cornea is almost like a perfect semisphere and is very reflective, so anything that is coming to the eye with a light emitting from those sources will have an image on the cornea. Those two eyes should have very similar reflective patterns because they're seeing the same thing. It's something that we typically don't notice when we look at a face, end quote. And continuing from Futurity, quote, When we look at something, the image of what we see is reflected in our eyes. In a real photo or video, the reflections on the eyes would generally appear to be the same shape and color. However, most images generated by artificial intelligence, including Generative Adversary Network or GAN images, fail to accurately or consistently do this, possibly due to many photos combined to generate the fake image. End quote. Liu and his team have developed a tool to spot these inconsistencies that was 94% effective with portrait-like photos in the experiments they did. They pulled photos from Flickr's Faces headquarters as well as the site ThisPersonDoesNotExist.com, which is a mind-boggling collection of AI-generated portraits that look completely lifelike. Quoting again from Futurity, the tool works by mapping out each face. It then examines the eyes, followed by the eyeballs, and lastly, the light reflected in each eyeball. It compares in incredible detail potential differences in shape, light intensity, and other features of the reflected light. While promising, Liu's technique has limitations. For one, you need a reflected source of light. Also, mismatched light reflections of the eyes can be fixed during editing of the image. Additionally, the technique looks only at individual pixels reflected in the eyes, not the shape of the eye, the shapes within the eyes, or the nature of what's reflected in the eyes. And finally, the technique compares the reflections within both eyes. If the subject is missing an eye, or the second eye is not visible, the technique fails. End quote. The paper has been accepted to be presented in June at the IEE International Conference on Acoustics, Speech, and Signal Processing, so presumably some additional steps will be taken after feedback at that conference. And despite the initial limitations, if anyone is qualified to create a tool that could consistently tell if an image is fake or not, it's Lou. He previously helped create the Deep Fakeometer, which is an open platform that allows you to upload a video and then it helps detect if the video is genuine or not. All that said, while these tools would be enormously helpful, especially if they can be integrated into social media platforms as like an automatic check for moderation, there is, of course, the potential that people will just use this information to work harder to eliminate these tells, turning it all into a deep fake whack-a-mole. So on the February 23rd episode of this show, I talked about how the stereotype of brewing and beer culture is heavily weighted towards white men. But in fact, there's a long history of black brewers in America and in many African cultures. And now I'd like to further demystify the white guy associations by talking about how beer brewing used to be considered a more womanly task in some cultures, up until about the 1500s when some men didn't like how successful the women brewers were getting, similar to the history of black brewers being pushed out, only in this case the men accused the women of being witches. 
The whole witch trial thing, while often associated with Salem, Massachusetts and 1692, actually went on for about three centuries, from the mid-1400s to the mid-1700s, and spanned throughout Europe and the Americas. Beer drinking, meanwhile, started long before that. Quoting Professor Lakin Brooks in The Conversation, From the Stone Age to the 1700s, ale, and later beer, was a household staple for most families in England and other parts of Europe. The drink was an inexpensive way to consume and preserve grains. For the working class, beer provided an important source of nutrients, full of carbohydrates and proteins. Because the beverage was such a common part of the average person's diet, fermenting was, for many women, one of their normal household tasks. Some enterprising women took this household skill to the marketplace and began selling beer. Widows or unmarried women used their fermentation prowess to earn some extra money, while married women partnered with their husbands to run their beer business." End quote. Brooks says women from cultures as disparate as the Vikings and the Egyptians brewed beer. One of the more badass saints, in my opinion, Hildegard von Bingen, is even the first known person to write about using hops in her beer recipe. Although she didn't love it, saying that they, quoting the Washington Post, induce melancholy and weigh down one's insides, end quote. And the Mary Sue points to a ton of goddesses across cultures who were associated with beer making. Quote, Ninkasi was the goddess of beer and beer making all the way back in ancient Sumeria. She now lends her name to Oregon's Ninkasi Brewing. In southern Africa, Mbaba Mwana Weresa was a goddess of fertility, agriculture, rainbows, and beer. And for the Egyptians, beer was foundational to their lives, and so they had a goddess for that too, who was also associated with magic, darkness, health, and protection, Isis's sister, Nephthys. In Europe, the association of powerful goddesses with ale-making abounds. One is Brigid, the Irish goddess of fire, smithing, poets, healing, and more, who was also associated with beer-making. And her Christian form, Saint Brigid, is a patron of brewing. And there are so many more. Gabjwajwa in Lithuania, Minna in Germany, Albina in Wales, and on and on. End quote. And as far as those mortal women in the Middle Ages and Renaissance who took to selling their beer at markets, often referred to as alewives, they could usually be found selling the beer from large cauldrons, with cats on hand to keep mice away from the grains, in ale stick, usually a broom, propped up against the stall as a sign that fresh beer was ready or used to flag down customers, and sporting big pointy hats so that customers could spot them in the crowded markets. So these women in tall, pointed hats were bubbling up potions in a cauldron with their cat and broomstick beside them. The story goes that in the 1500s, as the Reformation was beginning, large-scale commercial breweries, mostly run by men, were starting to ramp up, making use of newer emerging technologies. Brewing was starting to become a real profession, which meant that women and their cottage industry home brewing were naturally getting pushed out. But that slow-moving exclusion wasn't enough for some men. They wanted a quicker, more active way to push women out of brewing, so they began to tarnish their reputations. Some focused on the product, quoting Vice, according to Judith Bennett, the preeminent historian of women brewers in this period of England's history, both the public and the male-dominated brewing industry accused brewsters of diluting or adulterating their ale with cheaper brews, and thus of cheating customers. Brewsters were also accused of selling tainted ales that could make drinkers sick, perhaps intentionally, end quote. But taking advantage of the religious frenzy and associated stricter gender norms burgeoning under Reformation, some also accused women, either out of convenience or honest zealotry, of practicing witchcraft. Their cauldrons and extensive knowledge of herbs obviously being markers of brewing magic potions and the beer just a cover. Now, all of this definitely happened to varying extents, but what's less clear is to what extent some of the imagery of alewives that we associate now with witches was actually common enough among alewives to draw that connection. For example, the pointed hat being worn by alewives selling their beer at markets so they could be identified in a crowd is just one of several possible origins for that pointy witch's hat. Others include the anti-Semitic Jewish hat that Jewish people were forced to wear by the Catholic Church in the 1200s. This then led to the hat being associated with all sorts of heretical and satanic behavior. In America, the hat does somehow seem to flow from anti-Quaker sentiment, even though Quakers didn't wear pointed hats, but they did devoutly keep their hair covered, which was something the Puritans used to prosecute them for. 
And long before any of that, the witches of Subeshi from around the first century used to wear black funnel-shaped felt hats. There are so many other possible origins, some conflations all influencing each other in turn, like a similar hat being a common part of English country attire that seemed strange to snobbish city dwellers, or Scottish philosopher John Dunce, who literally believed in a fairly common metaphorical association with conical hats as rising your intellect through the tall hat above that of ordinary people. John Dunce is, of course, who we get the dunce cap from. Kinda came back to bite him in the butt there. But in general, tall conical hats were long associated with sorcery, advanced thinking, the esoteric, and getting closer to higher powers. But whether it was the alewives with their pointed hats, and cauldrons, cats, and broomsticks, being accused of witchcraft for continuing a centuries-long tradition of women, which led us to associate all of those symbols with our contemporary stereotype of witches or not, quoting Vice, one fact remains eerily, spookily true, that in history, the domestic work of women has often been devalued and erased by men who came to dominate the industries that were built on those skills, especially any skill that was important in the kitchen. And that, dear readers, is something that sends a chill down our spines and is a spell we'd like to break." End quote. That's all I've got for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday. Have a great weekend.